my news for us this morning, and I'll tell you what I'm just saying. Um, this Wednesday, we have um, our last admin service already. Um, the service is at 12.15. Uh, it's going to be preceded by a, a little uh, lunch. We'll have lunch and fellowship there at about 11.30 uh, in the morning. Uh, that's going to be down in the fellowship hall. Um, we also have Christmas Eve coming on Sunday. I hope everybody's uh, ready for that. Um, that morning, we're going to have our usual two services. There's going to be a uh, service and 1045. But in between, instead of the uh, Bible study, uh, you guys are all invited to come out to the fellowship hall. Uh, we're going to have a little, little time of fellowship. That's what the building's for. Uh, we're going to have some breakfast and drinks and that sort of thing. So everyone's invited to that as well. Um, we also have a Christmas Eve service, 7 p.m. Uh, that Sunday. So we'd we'll love to see you all you back for that. And then, of course, Christmas Day, one more service. If that wasn't enough for you. 1045 a.m. Um, if you notice, there's a, not a lot of uh, bad jokes this morning so far. I think Jason's not here. Uh, he's sick. Uh, so we're blessed instead to have James Freeman uh, with us this morning. He's going to deliver our sermon today and uh, start us with our invitation. You, you don't mind standing for me. I know you got your own way of doing things, but we'll figure this out together. And, and what I like to do is have everyone raise their hand with me and make the sign of the cross as we begin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. And now, my favorite part of every worship service, confession and absolution. And the reason is, I really need it. I know this because I went Christmas shopping this week at the mall. Sometimes I think I have my life together and that I'm a forgiving person, and then I have to deal with holiday traffic, finding a parking space, navigating the mall, dealing with kids crying, all those kinds of things, and I am reminded time and time again of a particular prayer that I like to pray uh, from our Divine Service book. You've maybe heard it before, but I like to use it as a call and response prayer, so if you'll repeat after me this confession. Most merciful, God, Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature, we we are by nature sinful, and unclean. sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, us. Renew, us. Renew us and lead us, and lead us. so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Please look up. It's my joy not only to remind you that you're forgiven, but to actually place it on you. As a called and ordained servant of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I forgive all your sins in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. All right, let's sing. Amen.
1 through 4 and 8 through 11, and can be found on page 620 of your pew Bible. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. To bring good news to the poor, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance for our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins, they shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their offspring shall be known among nations, and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. And all who see them shall acknowledge them that they are an offspring the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as the bridegroom decks himself like a priest with beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what it is sown to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all nations. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. Uh, a slight change to what might, been, might have been in your bulletin, uh, I called an audible so that the reading would match up with the sermon. So it's actually going to be Matthew chapter 25 today, verses 14 through 30. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who, re who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five more bags. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who, re who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown, and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers. So then, when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him, and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of the Lord. Please join me in confessing with 
Christians throughout the ages and around the world, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified and died in his grave. He ascended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You have to be seated.
And it's a leftover sermon about Thanksgiving leftovers, so it kind of works. <laughs> we just wrapped up a sermon series at St. Mark called The Tipping Point. Uh, it was a series all about how God fills us with his gifts. Gifts of grace, forgiveness, mercy, love, skills and talents and time, and money. And how he uses those gifts in and through us, how they overflow from us into other people. It's about those gifts that we're given reaching a tipping point. So I apologize that today is a leftover sermon, but I think it works well because we're entering into a season where we are celebrating the gifts that God has given us and how they flow into other people. So my favorite way to talk about God's gifts is through food metaphors. I love food, and there's one particular meal that I love above all other meals, and that's Thanksgiving. I love it. Everything about it. I love Thanksgiving because it's kind of the unofficial start to the Christmas season. I, I love it mostly because of the meal, though. I love turkey. Absolutely. Fried, baked, whatever. I love gravy. Hand me a glass of it, I'll drink it. Don't tell my cardiologist. <laughs> I love the green bean casserole, even, and the other, you know, sides that people tend to ignore. I love them. I love the fact that in America, we have a meal where we celebrate abundance and the tipping point that God has given us, and we share it with our friends and neighbors. I love it. Food, faith, fellowship on Thanksgiving. And if you're like me, a few weeks ago on Thanksgiving, you might have reached your own tipping point, eating and eating and eating until you could eat no more. And then the next day, you were faced with kind of a fun problem. What do you do with all the leftover food? So I'm going to walk through my typical Thanksgiving leftover journey. And it starts around midnight of Thanksgiving Day, where I go to the fridge and I make the greatest Thanksgiving sandwich you can. Grilled sourdough bread, turkey, a little bit of gravy, stuffing, cranberry mayonnaise, Swiss cheese, pickle, yeah. <laughs> Almost as good as the original meal. Maybe even a little bit better. <laughs> the next day, I, I do my second favorite thing to do with Thanksgiving leftovers. It starts to get you know, not quite as good. Go downhill a little bit, bit, but not much. And that's turkey tikka masala. I take all the dark meat and stew it in Indian spices with a ton of butter and heavy cream. Don't tell my cardiologist. <laughs> The next day, you start to get a little bit creative, and we're in Texas, so you, you should probably make something Tex-Mex, right? So I make turkey tacos with turkey and Thanksgiving and uh, stuffing and gravy and cranberry salsa. I mean, it kind of works, but, you know, it's stretching the limit of what a taco should be. The next day, old favorite, throw it into a casserole, turkey tetrazzini, which is basically chicken spaghetti but with turkey. And if it starts to taste a little stale, throw an extra cheese. It's going to be okay. <laughs> but at this point, about a week later, I'm starting to run out of ideas. And I do what some people do when they run out of ideas and go to the internet. Not a good idea. Especially if it's TikTok, where I went this year. And the big thing for TikTok Thanksgiving leftovers was Thanksgiving pizza this year. No, it did not work. It was not good. And then you find yourself maybe a week and a half later, and it's, it's midnight again, and you're standing over the sink eating a cold piece of turkey that you've dipped in cold gravy, and you realize it's just time to call it. It's time to throw out the leftovers. Leftovers can be great, but we don't have to get to the point where they are being wasted. Some of my favorite memories are from Thanksgiving, and one in particular taught me that the Thanksgiving meal is best the day of, and it is best shared with others. See, I was dating my wife, and I was invited to Thanksgiving at her house, and it was the first time I went, so I was a little bit overwhelmed, and there were a bunch of friends and family there, and there was one lady named Susan, and I went up to her and introduced myself, and asked her how she knew the Bratchers. And she said, oh, 
I was at the grocery store this morning with a frozen turkey dinner in hand, a tear in my eye, and your mother-in-law invited me to dinner. You see, she had just moved into the area and didn't have a place to go for Thanksgiving dinner. And my mother-in-law invited her, and it was a beautiful, beautiful moment, because it taught me a gospel truth. I remember my mother-in-law saying that uh, something along the lines of, the meal is best when it's fresh. And we always have too many leftovers. It's a shame not to share it when it's at its best. And that's a beautiful, beautiful gospel truth. You see, we sometimes treat God's gifts, especially the gospel message itself, like Thanksgiving leftovers. We want and enjoy the gifts God has given us, forgiveness, grace, mercy, and love, and we fill up on them to the brink. But then when it comes to having extra, extra good news, extra forgiveness, extra grace, skills, time, money, we hold on to the extra for way longer than we should. And honestly, we end up wasting God's gifts at times. Our inclination, our tendency is to hold on to God's gifts tightly and only share them when we know we have enough stored away in the fridge or in the freezer in case we want them later. But our God, He is not a God who gives leftovers. He doesn't hide His gifts in the freezer. He is free wheeling with them. God doesn't dish out leftovers. He is constantly giving us the best. And God's gifts have no end. There is always more fresh grace and mercy and forgiveness. Remember the parable of the prodigal son and the prodigal father? The son goes off and spends his inheritance. He's freewheeling with it, prodigal with it. And then he comes back home with his tail between his legs and his father welcomes him with open arms and throws a prodigal feast. He's freewheeling with his gifts. A huge, overflowing feast for his son. That's what our God does for us. We know our God does not hold on to leftovers because Christ gave us everything. His life, his death, and his resurrection for us. Each one of us has overflowing gospel gifts, and the biggest good news gospel gift that we have is Christ. It is not a leftover we feast on when we partake in the Lord's Supper. It's the main dish, served fresh, over and over again. And we don't have to give others leftovers either. God is giving us fresh grace, mercy, and forgiveness every single day. Our reading today is all about the amazing gifts that God has given us and how His gifts overflow past the tipping point. And I like to think, if Jesus told this parable today, especially this time of year, it might sound something like this. The parable of the turkeys. You know what it looks like when God is in control? When he is reigning as king? It looks a lot like a regional manager of a paper company who is about to go on vacation to Jamaica for the holidays. Before he leaves... He called his employees to the conference room for a meeting. To the assistant to the regional manager, he gave a 15-pound Kelly Bronze Heritage Turkey, the Rolls Royce of turkeys, priced at $14 a pound. To his second best salesman, he gave a 13-pound Whole Foods Market Organic Young Turkey, priced at $4 a pound. And to the temp, he gave a 12-pound Walmart Great Value Turkey, priced at $1 a pound. Each employee was given a turkey based on his talents and skills. Then the boss left for Jamaica. The one who received the Rolls Royce of turkeys wrapped the turkey in bacon, stuffed it with a Berkshire pork sausage dressing, and slow roasted it to perfection. He then invited his new neighbors who had just moved to America over for their first Christmas feast and served the heritage turkey with all the traditional sides. There were no leftovers. The second best salesman who received the organic Whole Foods Market Turkey injected his turkey with butter and spices and deep fried it. He brought his turkey to his girlfriend's family to get together in an attempt to impress her and her family. It worked, and there were no leftovers. 
But the temp, who received the great value turkey, emptied out the freezer in the break room and left his turkey at work over the Christmas holiday. He turned down the multiple invites he had for dinner and ordered a pizza which he ate alone at home. There were leftovers, which he eventually threw away. After a couple weeks, the manager returned and called a meeting where he asked his employees what they did with their turkeys. The assistant to the manager said, Sir, I wrapped your turkey in bacon, stuffed it with sausage, and served it to my family and the neighbors. It was a huge hit. Also, my neighbor just happens to run a print shop and is now a new client. The manager replied, great job, you are an amazing and faithful assistant. You proved that you can be trusted with even a small gift. Now I will put you in charge of much more. I'm having a party tonight with very important clients. You are invited. The salesman who received the organic Whole Foods turkey reported to his boss how he deep fried the turkey and brought it to his girlfriend's house and how it was a huge hit. He also reported that he too signed a new client at his Thanksgiving, or Christmas get-together. The manager replied, you too have proven that I can trust you with a little and can trust you with even more. You are also invited to my party this evening. Then the temp, who received the great value turkey, spoke up and said, sir, I know that you are a nightmare boss who is never happy no matter what I do. Plus, you close sales that I started and call my clients without my permission. I didn't want to make you upset, so I cleared out the break fridge and put your turkey in there. You can have it back. His manager responded, you horrible and lazy temp. If you really think that I call your clients and close your sales, then you should have at least given the turkey to another salesman who would have cooked it and shared it with potential clients. Then, when I returned, there would have at least been a chance that someone enjoyed the turkey, and maybe someone would have landed a client. Take the turkey away from them. Give it to the assistant manager. To all who I have given gifts to, even more will be given to the point where there will be even extra. But to those who despise my gifts, I will take away all my gifts. Please escort this Tim out of the office and onto the street. Let him see what it's like to live without my gifts. It will be harsh. Whenever I read a parable, either the original or a retelling, I ask this question first. Who is Christ in the parable? Now I'll give you a hint. In the parables in the Bible, Christ is usually the one in charge. The king, the manager, or he's the one doing the real work, sowing and reaping. So in this version of the parable, Christ is the boss, who's about to leave for a time, but return. See, you remember, this, this parable is part of a bigger discourse, where the disciples really are acting like kind of dumb sheep. Jesus keeps saying time and time again, I'm going to be leaving, but you're going to be okay. I'm going to be leaving, but you're going to be okay. And the sheep, the disciples, are freaking out. You're saying you're going to leave. Are we going to be okay? <laughs> and he keeps reminding them, you're going to be okay. I've got you. As things fall apart around you, remember that I care for you in small and big ways. That's his message throughout this end of the world discourse that he gives. So then we have to ask ourselves, what's, what's the turkey in the parable? In the original parable, it's sometimes called talents, which is a fancy word for big bags of gold. What, what are the bags of gold? What's the turkey? First and foremost, I want you to realize it's not necessarily talents you have. It's the message of the gospel. That's the biggest gift you have been given. It's the message that you are completely right with God, the creator of the universe, not because of anything you have done, any of the work you've done or tried to do or left undone. You are right with God because of the life, death, and resurrection of Christ given to you as if it's your own. All of his rightness, his righteousness, all of his work given to you, and you get credit for it. You're right with God. That is the turkey. That's the gift you've been given. 
Secondly, the bag of gold, the talents, the turkey is also those other gifts that God gives you. As you rest in the true gift of the gospel, you can start to think about the other gifts God has given you, the gifts that flow out of the gospel, what I, what I like to call gospel gifts. Your time, your skills, your love, your mercy, your forgiveness, your grace you show others. And yes, your money and more tangible gifts that God has given you. So then we have to ask ourselves, who are we in a parable? And it's usually not an answer you like to hear. It's usually whoever's struggling in the world. But in this parable, we've got kind of two options, don't we? We've got the good servants, the good employees, and we've got the ten. And you're probably both at times, aren't you? Let's look at the temp first, because the temp actually has some interesting things to say. The temp just might be completely right about what he says to the boss. You're never happy with the work I do. It's never good enough. That is 100% true. God demands of us perfection, perfect work to be right with him. So isn't it amazing he gives us that gift in Christ? So the temp is right. He calls it. God, you demand perfection. And I can't do it. I'm never going to make you happy. But then he says something even more beautiful. You take what's not yours. And that's exactly what God does. He takes your sin. And he closes the sails for you. He makes things right for you. He does the work for you. As you're working out in the world, trying to do what's right, he closes the sail. In the end, he really does get credit for everything. And I think that's what the temp doesn't like. Why he refuses the gift because it's not something he did or earned. He's not going to get credit for it. So don't be a temp. Take the gift of the gospel, and instead of burying it in the back of a freezer, do something with it. And this is where we get to talk about those good servants. You and me, taking the gifts God has given us. What does that look like? That's where it gets confusing. Who here has cooked a Thanksgiving or Christmas roast or turkey? Yeah. It can be complicated and overwhelming. I remember the first time I tried to cook a turkey. I went to Barnes & Noble and went to the cookbook aisle and pulled down every celebrity chef's cookbook. Martha Stewart, Gordon Ramsay, Jamie Oliver, those are my big three. Pulled down every cookbook I could find and looked up the perfect turkey recipe. And you know what I found out? They all contradict each other. Roast it at a high temperature first. No, don't do that. Do that last. Baste it. Don't baste it. Wrap it in bacon. Oh, no. Don't do that. Spatchcock it. Deep fry it. No, you'll burn the house down. You can't find one perfect recipe for turkey. But this is what Christian life is like. If you meander down the aisle at Barnes & Noble, past the cookbooks to the Christian life books, You'll find recipe after recipe after recipe for what a disciple looks like. And many of those books tell you this is the perfect recipe for Christian life. No, this is the perfect recipe for Christian life. And you know what? Just like the cookbooks, they contradict each other. And sometimes they contradict Scripture. So here's the beautiful truth. As good servants who have been given a gift from God, the way you bake your turkey is going to look different than other people. There are lots of ways to cook a beautiful turkey. Fry it, spatchcock it and grill it, bake it. I've done them all. And that's what Christian life is like. As you take God's gifts and do things with them, it's going to be difficult at first. It's going to feel strange. It's going to get easier over time, and you're going to see other people's recipes, and you're going to learn different things, and you're going to find there are infinite ways to put God's gifts at work. 
The only thing you shouldn't do is leave it in the freezer or serve it cold to other people. One final story before we wrap up. The best Thanksgiving meal I ever had started off as the worst Thanksgiving I ever had. I had moved to Georgia right out of college and looking for a job, and what I ended up with was a security guard position at a uh, private school. And my job was, when the school wasn't in session, my job was to tell people to leave the campus. And it was a cool campus. Football field, playgrounds, walking tracks, all that stuff, a lake. My job was to tell people not to have fun, to leave. And I drew the short straw and had to be the security guard on Thanksgiving Day from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. My first Thanksgiving away from my family. I don't think I mentioned this before. I, don't, I, I cry quite a bit, but most of the time I cry over food. And I, I had a rough day that day shopping for my frozen Thanksgiving meal that I took to my job. And then spent the whole day watching families who had just feasted on their feasts at home coming and trying to walk off the calories and me telling them, no, you gotta go home. And at 4 p.m., a lady showed up with her dog to go for a walk, and I had to tell her, no, leave. And I was almost at my tipping point. And she stared at me, gave me a look, and finally just left. Hour and a half later, as I'm sitting down with my frozen cardboard turkey meal, I see that lady show up again and start to get out of her van. And I walk outside, past my tipping point, losing it, crying over the food, crying over not being with my family, and crying that I gotta deal with this lady again. And I walk up towards her. She gets out, and I say, ma'am, and she says, Hold on, young man. The finger raised in the air. And I don't know if you've ever been a young man before. <laughs> the last thing you want to hear is young man. But I did. I waited for a second as I composed myself. She walked around the back of her van, opened up the hatch, and starts to hand me hot, steaming dishes of turkey, mashed potatoes, gravy, green bean casserole, all the fixings best Thanksgiving I've ever had. Her tipping point, her sharing the gift she had with me, I don't even know her name, changed my life that day. She didn't literally share with me the gospel, but she shared with me the gospel. God did not give you leftover gifts. God joyfully shared his best with you to the tipping point. He gives you the gift of Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection for you. You get to rest in the truth that he will do all the work of making things right between you and him and will return and make all things right. In the meantime, as he fills you to the tipping point, he will joyfully use you and others in beautiful in unexpected ways to share his gospel, his good news and gifts with others. And that is some seriously good news that you can rest in and be thankful for. Amen? Amen. Please join me in prayer. Father God, we thank you for joyfully sharing your best with us. We thank you for filling us to the tipping point each and every day. Help us to not treat your gifts like leftovers, but to share our best with others the same way you did when you shared your Son. Work in and through us and despite us to joyfully share the gospel message with others. Help us not to treat the skills, time, and money you have gifted us as mere leftovers, but instead inspire us and enable us and equip us to share your gifts in creative, unique, and unexpected ways. Amen. Please stand. I invite you to join me in partaking in a gift that Jesus gave us directly. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who 
art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for our and ever. Amen. I now invite our ushers to come forward and uh, gather offerings. If, if you're visiting here today, we're not looking for gifts from you. We're looking to share gifts with you. But if you're a member here, I, I ask you to, to let those gifts overflow uh, to spread the gospel.
So I'm from a different church. We have different traditions. So I'm going to teach you one. If you don't mind cupping your hands right now, receive a blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his overflowing peace. Amen. Amen. You have blessed, been blessed to be a blessing. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thank mm -hmm. you.